Good morning. Good morning, class. <laughs> so this morning in the, in the session that will begin in a few minutes, uh, we will venture into simply a variation or almost like the cherry on the cake of the practice of shamatha without a sign, simply resting in awareness, called merging the mind with space. And we actually kind of got to that at the very final phase of the shamatha without a sign as taught by Padmasambhava. You bring your awareness, the locus of your awareness to your heart, and then kind of supernova. <laughs> Just merge your mind with space. And so that's what we'll be doing now called Merging the Mind with Space. And I could spend the whole morning on this because it goes very deep, very fast. And it's addressing questions that we're, we've always been asking, religious, not religious, even all animals, all sentient beings have been asking if they're smart enough. And that is, well, of course we don't want to suffer. Intelligent people ask why. And not looking just for things that may catalyze suffering, but re what makes us vulnerable to suffering, why are we fundamentally capable of suffering. It's not so clear in terms of evolutionary biology. There's no good answer for that. There's no sign. We, we, why not just program, program biological organism without pain? What would be the problem with that? But there it is. Evolutionary biology is brilliant and completely incomplete. So the question we're already asking is why are we vulnerable to suffering and can we do anything about it? And come back to the second noble truth as viewed from the Dzogchen perspective, what is the origin of suffering? This too, I mentioned it before, but now as a reminder as we're coming towards the end of the retreat. We are vulnerable to suffering, we're prone to suffering because we identify with that which is ni neither I nor mine in reality, just not at all, as being I or mine. And that makes us vulnerable. That's the first half of the equation, and I'll give the second half right now. And we fail to recognize who we really are. And so we use this term sentient being, sentient being a lot in English. It's a very good translation. Uh, and a sentient being is a conscious being who is in samsara, prone to suffering and the causes of suffering and perpetuating that vulnerability, perpetuating the cycle of birth, aging, sickness, and death, and continuing to accrue more causes to keep that cycle running. So there is such a thing as a perpetual, a perpetual motion machine. You know, it's an issue in physics, kind of has to do with what is the third law of thermodynamics, I think. But yeah, there is such a thing as a perpetual, a perpetual motion machine. It's called samsara. Because there's nothing for it to rub into that it can slow down. And so then it just perpetuates itself and indefinitely. So samsara will never poop out. It'll never just get exhausted. No, I'm tired. I'll just give you, I'm just so tired of you. I'll just give you, give you nirvana. Never happens. And so, but two terms I think are very useful. I know I'm taking a bit of valuable time here, but I think I'm filling it with things that at least I know to be valuable. One of the synonyms for sentient being in Tibetan is luche. Luche means a body haver. You're a body haver. And a body haver is that we're identifying, here we are, we have this body, we're identifying with this body for which no part of the body actually believes it belongs to anyone. Not, not even think, not the frontal cortex, not the pineal gland, not any part of the body actually be belongs to anyone. If you think it does, show me the landlord, show me the landlady that you know owns the body, and I think you can look for something that can never be found. In fact, you can find that it is not to be found. But nevertheless, even though the body doesn't belong to anyone, and it's certainly not a person, no part of the body is a person. Not of the collect, not all of the collected parts of the body are a person. Nevertheless. How often do we look into the mirror and think we're looking at ourselves? How often, if somebody insults our form, do we feel upset? You're fat, you're skinny, you're this, that. Or you're very attractive, and then we feel happy about that. As if we are a body. Well, nobody is a body. And this is one of the things, I have an axe to grind against materialism, because it encourages us to, to believe this delusional and terribly destructive thought that you are your body. That's really awful. Relatively, few people have really physically attractive bodies, and if they do, it won't be for long. And so to identify something, to identify with this is me, that's not nice. If it's true, then you just, you know, bite the bullet, deal with it. But it's not true. To tell people something is not true is true. They'll only make them suffer. That's really a bad message. So materialists, remember Bob, Bob Newhart? Stop it. 
We are luchin, we are sentient beings, we are perpetuating our own suffering because we're identifying with the body and taking it really seriously. And we're reifying the body as existing something as something in and of itself. That's going to keep you in samsara indefinitely. It will never stop. As long as you cling to, identify with, and then reify your body, you're stuck indefinitely. And there's no way out. Not a bullet, not poisoning, not dying of old age. Samsara doesn't just stop because you stop breathing. I wish it did. That'd be very nice. But that's wishful thinking without any basis in, in empirical evidence or reasoning. There's one word, and the other one, and I've told you before, sim jin is the word that we translate as sentient being, and it means a mind haver. And it's the same thing. We collapse down our awareness to the size of our individual human mind. I am a man, I'm a woman, I'm this, I'm that, I'm old, I'm young. We collapse down, we collapse it down to this tiny little human mind that's arising independence upon the brain and think this is really mine. And yet, if you check out, you really scrutinize the whole bandwidth of mind, which you do in the Vipassana practice of a close application of mind to the mind close application of mindfulness to the mind. You see, there's nothing there that belongs to anybody. There's no person that's generating. So individual person, ego, that's generating the thoughts, they are they're natural phenomena. Thoughts, desires, motivations, they're all natural phenomena that arise independence upon prior condition, none of which is an inherently existent autonomous self. And so identifying with the mind as being really mine is a mistake, let alone identifying deeply with any activity of the mind. I am mad, I am happy, I am, I am. Complete fusion of identity with any aspect of the mind is, it's claustrophobic, it's claustrophobic. So then back to Bob Newhart, if you can just stop it, if you can just stop it, that rather than being really tricky and fancy and doing all kinds of esoteric practices, if you can just stop, basta. Just stop identifying with the body, stop identifying with the mind. And as we find in the practice of Tong Len, giving and saying, just give them away. <gasps> like that. Give away your body. Shantideva really elaborates on that point. Now I'm giving my body away. It's very for other people to use. I'm, I'm, I'm everybody's servant. I'm giving this body away. It doesn't belong to me anymore. And then you give away your mind, your creativity, your intelligence, whatever skills you have. I'm giving them all away. And what are you left with? And this is a real question. What are you left with if you completely release any sense of I or mine pertaining to body, anything the body does, your mind, anything the mind does? If you completely, <gasps> what's left? Do you become non-existent? What's left when you give away your body and mind with no longer, no residual sense that it's in any way mine, let alone inherently real? Just, <gasps> What's left when you give away your human mind with your personal history and gender and cultural conditioning and so forth? When you give away that mind, what lingers is the substrate consciousness. That was there before you were, before you were conceived, and it will be after you're dead. After you're dead, that will continue on. So if you give away the whole of your human body, human mind, <laughs> that's what left is just the substrate consciousness. It looks like a very direct route to achieving shamatha. But the substrate consciousness is still individuated. One such separate consciousness for every sentient being. So it's still, it's not as collapsed, it's not claustrophobic in space and time as identifying with this old chunk of meat that just gets shrivelier and shrivelier and so forth. He's getting older and weaker and smellier and, and then finally just dies. And the mind just goes, whoosh, and gone. But if you're still identifying with the substrate consciousness, well, it's not, it's not smelly, and it's not really, it doesn't have borders, so it's not claustrophobic, but it is only, it's yours only, it's an individuated, individuated, individuated stream. And if you look at that stream carefully, and this is Vipassana on the nature of the substrate consciousness, which goes very deep, very fast, you see the substrate consciousness doesn't belong to anyone. And the substrate consciousness is not human, it's not a person, it's not an, an ego. It's just a substrate consciousness, and it's not you, and it's not really yours. If you think it's really yours, good, show me you. Show me the landlord once again. And so if you can cut through that, cut through the identification with the substrate consciousness, and really this is where the rubber hits the road, 
When you're resting in shamatha, you're resting in the substrate consciousness after having achieved shamatha. You remember in what is the Iliad or the Odyssey, the sirens, S-I-R-E-N, that come hither, come here, and they just capture you, but you really want to go there? You know what the three sirens of the substrate co consciousness are once you've achieved shamatha? You do. Bliss. Luminosity. Non-conceptuality. I will fulfill your every desire. Come and stay. Come and stay. That business about liberation, enlightenment, you don't need that. Other sentient beings, they'll get by. Don't worry about them. <laughs> come, come. Just come to my arms. I have three arms. Bliss, luminosity, and unkepsuality, and I will fill your every desire, and every time you come, I will satisfy you. I'm really bad at looking, trying to imagine myself a really beautiful young woman. It's hard, isn't it? But they are, there's that, exactly that. The, something is indispensable to get there if you want to venture out on the path, and if you get stuck there, you have not taken, moved one hair's breadth towards the path. So if you, imagine how difficult this would be. So prepare yourself. Some of you might achieve in shamatha in this lifetime. So you want to prep yourself for that. Because when you achieve it, you're going to have these three sirens coming to you and say, all that other stuff Alan talked about, you don't need that. Aren't you happy? Am I not, am I not making you happy? <laughs> Is there something missing? What more can I do for you? You want more bliss? I got more. Luminosity and unkind. I got more. Just stay with me. If you can not identify with not prefer, not cling to, not be attached to this bliss, which is the bliss you always wanted, the luminosity, the intensity you always wanted, the sense of serenity, stillness, peace, security, safety, stillness that you always wanted. If you cannot prefer that, but just be present with it and not reify it as existing any one of those three, as existing un, in and of themselves, if you can bring to these nyam, these meditative experiences of bliss, luminosity, and non-conceptuality, if you can bring that same stillness of awareness to them and simply witness them without identifying with them or reifying them, then you just may go into free fall beyond the substrate, not clinging to or identifying with the substrate, and go into free fall. Like a skydiver that just goes out backwards out of an airplane into, into sky, but never hits. Imagine, you've all seen skydivers just going backwards out of the airplane, out of the, ba the back of the airplane. Imagine going like that. But you never hit. You never strike anything solid. Go into free fall, beyond the substrate consciousness, and you free fall, and you cut through to a pristine awareness, primordial consciousness. And that's when you come to know who you have always been. So stop identifying with that which you are not. And recognize who you are. And your mind is Dharmakaya. Your mind is Buddha mind. You don't have a Buddha, you don't have a Buddha nature, you are a Buddha nature. But you won't know that as long as you still keep on identifying with something you're not. Collapsing down this vast open spaciousness beyond space, beyond time, a pristine awareness, transcendent, divine, sacred, ultimate ground of being. We collapse this down out of ignorance and delusion, not knowing who we are. We mistakenly think that this body is I, this mind is I, this substrate consciousness is I. And we take that spaciousness, which is of the nature of immutable bliss, and we turn our backs on it and collapse to the shriveling little stream of consciousness, the substrate consciousness, or even smaller in space and time, this tiny little mind that's only going to be around for a few decades, and this tiny little body. It's amazing we don't die of claustrophobia. Because we've just made two magnets for suffering. As soon as I identify with this body and reify it, ready to suffer. As soon as I identify with this mind and reify it, ready to suffer. And we did it to ourselves. So when you give away your mind and implicitly you release your body, all of your experiences of body, release it into space, release your mind into space, with no, with no fishing line to reel it back in again, whew, then all that remains is that which was already there, 
timelessly, pristine awareness. It's called ngo kada. Ngo kada. Kada. Primordial purity. Primordial purity. That's one of the synonyms of this mind of clear light, pristine awareness, Buddha nature. And so, in order to come to know who we are, and we are, our own minds are at root, at ground, ultimately, they are pristine awareness, which is beyond all conceptual constructs. Uh, is mine the same as yours or is identical to yours? Does not compute. You can't put it in those boxes. Is it one or many? Does it arise or pass? Does it exist or not exist? Does it come or does it go? Beyond all conceptual categories. But as long as we're identifying with ca conceptual categories, getting locked in, then we slam the door in our own faces and seal off who we actually are. And so ultimately, in Dzogchen practice, the direct route to realizing who we are is to completely, from our own perspective, completely deactivate our physical bodies as iron mind doing things and completely deactivate one's speech and completely deactivate the mind. In other words, ultimately right down to the ultimate ground, settle your body, speech and mind in the natural states so they're utterly deactivated. In other words, there's nothing there to identify with because they're just completely deactivated. And in that ultimate stillness, in that total stillness of not even identifying conventionally relatively or nominally, not even nominally, thinking I am human being, I am sentient being, I am body haver, not even conventionally. In that release totally, in that utter stillness, then you know that your mind is Dharmakaya. And so that would be the Buddhist interpretation of a very short phrase, and I'll have to, have to ask you, a young, is it Psalms? Be still and know that I am God. Psalms? Be still and know that I am God. I have no doubt that the Jews and Christians have their own interpretation. I would not debate that. It's their scripture. But this is to be a Buddhist interpretation. Be still. Completely deactivate your human body, human mind, your sentient being's body and mind. Completely deactivate. Totally cease any identification with it, be absolutely still, and what's left is you are the primordial Buddha, and you always have been, but you've been dreaming that you're a sentient being. And so therefore the Buddha said, I am not a human being. I'm awake. Oh, no, so that caught your attention, didn't it? So, let's try. Releasing the mind, and as, oh, it's a beautiful phrase, it's right towards the beginning, maybe even the first chapter of Shantideva, where I can paraphrase this, I wish I could quote it directly, but I can't. But he says, in effect, giving everything, else, giving everything away at once. Not only your body and mind, but your possessions, your loved ones, any, anything out there you think is mine. My family, my country, my ethnic group, my anything that you think this is mine, and just releasing everything that you identify with totally, all at once. He said, giving everything away at once, that's nirvana. And he says, and my mind seeks nirvana. So take the sting out of death. Before death can come to you, go to death. Keep your body healthy, please. Have a long life. You know what I mean, though. Death will take everything from you except for your substrate consciousness and your pristine awareness, death can't reach that far. But death can't take your substrate consciousness away. But it can sure as heck take your body and mind away. And that for people who are insofar as we're identifying with the body and mind, my, my, my body, my mind, cherishing, clinging to it, my body, I have to take care of it. The Lord of death is gonna sn snatch it and leave you with no body. And then take your mind and you're gonna have no mind just a substrate consciousness, which is primal. So beat him to the punch, this Lord of Death. Before you can take it away, I'm going to give it away. So when you come, I'm going to go. <laughs> a friend of mine was trained for six years in Thailand in a, in a monastery. 
And there was an old monk, old monk, very virtuous monk, very, very, des- very real meditator, very pure ethics and so forth, fine monk. And this old monk turned to my friend, and he was clearly dying. He was clearly dying. And the old monk told this young monk about my age, and this was a long time ago. He said, the Lord of death is looking for me, but he can't find me. And my friend thought he was kind of basically in denial, like, I'm going to make I'm going to make it through this. The guy's on his deathbed. And so my friend said, oh, Bante, teacher, the Lord of death is going to find you. He wanted to kind of give him a reality check. You are going to die, old man. And then the old monk looked at him and just smiled. The Lord of death is looking for me, but he can't find me. Let's practice. Trust yourself to the ultimate object or objects of refuge from your own perspective, giving that existential sense of joyful surrender, joyful ease, fearlessness, because you have taken refuge in that which can provide refuge, grant you what you seek. As for motivation, bring forth the most sublime motivation you can imagine to imbue the practice with the greatest possible meaning. And the most sublime I can imagine is to aspire for, utterly dedicate oneself to, with all of one's heart, one's might, one's mind, to the perfect awakening, the perfect unveiling of one's own Buddha nature, pristine awareness for the sake of all sentient beings, to lead each one from suffering and its causes to their own perfection. Arouse bodhicitta, if you will. And then as we turn once again, in a way ever so familiar by now, settling body, speech, and mind in the natural state, it may become increasingly clear to you that the release, the balance for each of three three phases is the ground for all of your practice. It permeates the path to your own liberation, your own awakening. And it's at its deepest, at its perfection, You find it at the culmination. There it is in the fruition, the perfection of settling your body, speech, and mind in the natural state. And realizing your mind is Dharmakaya, your speech as Samogakaya, your body as Nirmanakaya. Let's do so now, setting out on this path of perfection.
as you release all grasping. To the best of your ability, releasing all grasping or identification with the body or any activities of the body. Or grasping to the speech, whether your verbal public speech or the inner speech of the mind. And releasing all grasping to the activities of the mind, the states of mind, the human mind more fully and deeply you can release all grasping to this sentient being's body and mind, then your awareness naturally settles, effortlessly settles in stillness. A stillness beyond the relativity of stillness and motion, the stillness beyond those two parameters, primordial stillness. The relative stillness is the stillness of shamatha. The ultimate stillness is the stillness of pristine awareness that transcends space altogether. Approximate that now. Awareness resting in its own stillness, holding its own ground. In that stillness free of grasping, the natural luminosity of awareness effortlessly shines forth. Transcending your mind and ultimately transcending your own substrate consciousness. Rest there. Make your home there. When you have found your rest there, your, your awareness has descended by releasing all grasping, descended to its own place, and there, without grasping, it holds its own ground, still, motionless. Now let your eyes be softly open. without focusing your mental awareness on any, on any visual form or object. Just create this spaciousness now. With no suggestion that you're inside your head. The spaciousness of which you are aware now is not confined by the walls of this room. We're not speaking of physical space. It is that open, infinite expanse to which we directed our attention up, to the right, left, and down. The space of awareness with no borders, no center or periphery. Rest your awareness in that space, unimpeded in all directions. Saturated by the luminosity of awareness itself.
The activities of, of your mind will, of course, continue to arise. But they may arise without an owner. They may arise without being reified, without grasping onto them as existing in and of themselves. The mind will continue to run, but you don't need to run with it. In fact, you can release it, since you have identified to it, held closely to it, what you have done. You may undo, you may stop doing. So I shall just once utter a short, sharp syllable. And when you hear that sound, it's just a sound, in that instant, Cut your mind loose. Cut the cord. Release your mind into space, all of it. Release your mind into space. Merge it with space. Let it disappear, evaporate without trace into the open, infinite expanse of the space of awareness. I'll recite this syllable just once, meaning release. And thereafter, we'll continue sitting quietly. And of course, more activities, images, thoughts, desires, of course, more will continue to arise. And whatever arises for the duration of the session, Release it into space, as if there's a strong wind blowing from behind you. And these thoughts, images, and so forth are dry leaves. And the thought comes up, and it's blown away and dissolves into space. Release your mind continually, moment by moment, and rest in what remains. Once you've released your mind and merged it with space. So we'll begin with the syllable and continue in silence.
to very briefly link this session here with the conversation, the dialogue that Ivan and I had last night. Dzogchen, from the Dzogchen view, one could say, original sin occurs in every instant that we fail to recognize who we are. Samatavadra, Buddha, primordial Buddha, we fail to recognize who we are. And then out of that, we mistake who we are. We mistake this person as being really me, this body is really mine, this mind is really mine. And that didn't occur 8,000 years ago, it didn't occur 13.8 billion years ago with the Big Bang. Samsara begins in every instant. Every instant that we become mind havers, every instant we become body havers, every instant we fail to recognize who we actually are, fail to recognize non-dually our own awareness as pristine awareness, which is originally pure, kata'a, means originally pure. So it's originally pure, and we engage in original sin by failing to recognize it. We see appearances as other than ourselves, whereas if we viewed reality from the perspective of pristine awareness, which is the view of the great perfection, we would see from that perspective that all appearances are displays of the great perfection, that it is all good, absolutely primordially good from that perspective, not from the perspective of sentient beings. It's an ocean of suffering, permeated by the unsatisfying nature of all phenomena that we cling to, that we realize. So every incident that we fail to view appearances from the perspective of pristine awareness, we fall into samsara. That's when samsara begins. Whereas if we view appearances from the perspective of pristine awareness, we see all appearances without exception, all appearances of the whole of samsara and nirvana, all appearances as being spontaneous displays, effulgences, creative expressions of our own pristine awareness. And so all appearances are divine, sacred, primordially pure. And that's what reality looks like from the perspective of pristine awareness. So again, to use Western terminology, that's what reality looks like if you have a God's eye view, but God is not somebody else. So we don't have many rituals in this retreat. I generally don't, not because they're not useful, but I don't want to have to explain too much in terms of ritual and symbols. But we have this, you know what that is. That's just entirely for the sake of the teacher. We've been through that one. So that's the symbol, meaning of life. I, I did it very consciously this morning. Yep, that's true. Cool, then I can relax. If I'm going to be dead soon, then I can relax. You know, whatever people think of me, don't think of me, whatever. Do your best. My motto is, do your best and die. <laughs> Pretty much sums up things for me, you know. Hmm. And be ready to go. Bags packed, pay off your debts. Ready to go at a, at a moment's notice. Yeah. Hmm. But the other ritual, of course, is this this. And in Asia, that's just a greeting. Hello, namaste, namaste. But most of us here are not Asian. I'm certainly not. But I picked this up really from the Zen tradition. I've taught in a couple of Zen centers, monasteries. And this, I think it's called Gasho, isn't it? It's Gasho. And they do this all the time. There's a lot of doing this. The, the Roshi does it to the students. The students do it to the Roshi. The Roshi, students do it to the, to the students. The Roshi does it to the students. It's just Gasho all over the way. They're just gushing with Gasho. And so then we can say, well, yeah, but what's this about? I mean, it looks like you're bowing. It looks like you're showing reverence or respect. And I can tell you that the Roshi gashos to the students as much completely equally as the students gasho to the Roshi and to each other. Because what we're bowing to is not the quality of the sentient being in front of us. We're not bowing to that sentient being substrate consciousness. It's nothing to bow to. It's just it's your primal flow, the your ground of samsara. There's nothing to bow to there. What you're bowing to, of course, is the Buddha nature in every sentient being. So you can bow to crickets, cockroaches, sparrows, slugs, fish, reptiles, alligators, crocodiles. Next time you see a crocodile, gosh, you. but from a distance. 
So I really like it. I really like doing it. I'm, I'm an American, and we're raised in a democracy, and the notion of equality is kind of, I hope he, I hope he holds on to it. It's really valuable. The notion that all human beings are fundamentally equal, and if you're a Buddhist in America, that all sentient beings are created equal. So that's what this is about. It's bowing to the original purity, the pristine awareness of every sentient being. And symbolically, in a practice we'll do later on, symbolically we can imagine this pristine awareness, this Buddha nature, as an incandescent radiant pearl of light, an orb of light at the heart, heart chakra. It's a nice symbol. And it corresponds to where the very subtle energies converge when you manifest, when you're explicitly aware of, in a non-dual fashion, your own indwelling mind of clear light, another synonym for pristine awareness. And the energies all converge there in what's called the indestructible drop, nishipitikle, in the heart. That's its kind of subtle, subtle physio physiological correlate. And it's at the heart. So from the heart to heart. It's nice. So those two symbols I am bringing. So that was a practice of merging mind with space. It is the culmination of the culmination. If the subtlest of all shamatha practice is shamatha without sign, that's the finishing touch, where you're no longer trying to develop anything. You're not trying to develop shamatha. You're not trying to improve your mind, purify your mind, develop your mind, cultivate your mind, none of the above. Just <laughs> give it away and rest in what remains. So it's very nice. The basis for this, I've encountered again in the Dzogchen tradition. I think we can find it pretty quickly here. Merging the mind with space on page 15. I'm not going to read all of this. Time is short. But from a text that I taught just last spring, I spent eight weeks teaching this text, The Enlightened View of Samatabhadra, is one of the five Dzogchen texts revealed by Dujum Lingba, who died in 1904, I believe it was. Um, and I'll just mention the context for this briefly. I think you can read it, and now that we've done it, I think you'll find this fairly self-explanatory. Um, but he teaches it in this text, and then something similar in another text, the Vajra Essence. And there are, in Dzogchen specifically stated, there are people of sharp faculties, medium faculties, and dull faculties. Great, medium, and small. And it's, just, it's, it's not that some people are simply intrinsically better, but some are bringing more momentum, spiritual momentum, to this life in terms of their Dharma practice than others. So in the past, if lifetime after lifetime, you were just, you trained in music, you, were, you excelled in music, you cultivated, you had a passion in music, you devoted your life to music, then you might be born as, a, as, as the kid of Mr. and Mrs. Mozart and finding, oh, our child is writing symphonies at the age of eight. Well, he brought in, from the Buddhist perspective, brought in tremendous momentum, and likewise, there are geniuses of all sorts, and there are geniuses, without a doubt, there are geniuses in Dharma. Ch children who just are displaying profound insight. I could go on, but that is true. And so there are some people with tremendous momentum, some people with moderate momentum, some people with a little bit of momentum, and that's how we manifest in this lifetime, as having great, medium, or small fa faculties. And so it's a placement. A person like Bahia in the Theravada tradition, sharp faculties. You hear one Dharma talk, it becomes an arhat. Well, he brought tremendous momentum to that. You know, hardly anybody could hear that Dharma talk and achieve any kind of realization, let alone become arhat. But he brought great momentum to it. He was extremely ripe, and the Buddha just and then send them off to a hot ship. Within Dzogchen, similar things have happened. That a person might be introduced just to examine your mind. Examine your mind. Can you find the origins of your mind, really? If it's really there, can you find the origins of your mind? Can you find where your mind really is located? Where is it really located? And then when you fall asleep, for example, your mind vanishes. When you die, your mind vanishes. Where does it go? Just origin, location, destination. Penetrate. And some people, just by hearing that, will realize Rigpa, pristine awareness. And once you've realized it, you just rest in it. Because there's nothing to improve. You can't, you can't diminish and you can't augment pristine awareness. It's timeless. So there's nothing to cultivate. So some people just hear that. and Just to hear a Dharma talk. And they just follow it. Like Bahia, just following the Buddha's instructions, achieved arhatship. A very ripe Dzogchen practitioner may hear just those instructions. And if sh of sharp faculties, they can skip shamatha, they can sh skip vipassana, they go directly right into rikpa, pristine awareness, and then they rest there in utter inactivity. And then just watch, observe passively the spontaneous emergence and actualizations 
of all the qualities of Buddha mind. It's really kind of a Buddhist notion of grace because you're not cultivating this, you're not acquiring this. You're just and then watching them all arise, like opening a treasure and just watching compassion arise, wisdom arise, paranormal abilities arise, just flowing, flowing, flowing. So your practice becomes radically simple. That's called non-meditation. There's a text that I translated called Buddhahood without meditation. And that's once you've arrived there, then you don't meditate on anything at all. So, so that's for sharp faculty, medium faculties. If you're medium faculties, then what Padmasambhava in these pure visions says, all right, if you want to see whether you're a person of medium faculties, then what I suggest is go off into solitude. Just total solitude, total simplicity. Go, there, go out there into the wilderness, total solitude for 20 days. And, 20, and during that 20 days, nonstop, as continuously as you possibly can, day and night, <laughs> release your mind into space. Don't identify with your mind at all. Release it without trace into space and do that continuously for 20 days. And if you're a person of mid middling faculties, then in the course of that 20 days, you will realize Rigpa. You'll be able to dwell in Rigpa. And sh the qualities of shamatha and vipassana will arise like cream emerging from milk. And you will not need to practice shamatha or vipassana. Once again, you cut through your mind and subject consciousness. You cut through to the primordial purity of your own pristine awareness. And you just rest there. And that's it. You just do that. Medium faculties. But if you become anxious, bored, mind is scattered, and so forth and so on, then okay, then, then you're like me person of inferior faculties, dull faculties. In which case, then he said, okay, in that case, then now take your impure mind as a path and get giddy up, and giddy up, and giddy up. Hop on your horse and head out on the path and achieve shamatha. Settle your mind as natural state. Then probe the very ultimate nature of your mind. Realize the emptiness of all phenomena. And once you've done that, now you're ready. If you want to show a really straight, unelaborated path, achieve shamatha on the mind. Recognize the relative nature of mind. Cut through any reification of your mind and awareness itself. Recognize the emptiness of inherent nature of your own mind, of your own awareness itself. And then, release all grasping and just go into free fall. All grasping to bliss, luminosity and non-conceptuality, all grasping of reification. and rest in awareness that is beyond the parameters of existence and non-existence, and therefore unborn, unceasing. And then that's your path. So, so you can do that for 20 days. That's your placement exam. And if you pass that exam, please write to me, because <laughs> I would like to receive teachings from you. So let's just, I'll just read the first one, because this is right from Padmasambhava, this brilliant text, summarizes the entire path to enlightenment in about 80 pages. There are two kinds of paths. Individuals with supreme faculties proceed within themselves by way of the direct crossing over. They just rest in pristine awareness, and then they immediately go to the culminating phase of Dzogchen, called the direct crossing over, in which you really explicitly manifest all the qualities of Buddha mind, Buddha body, speech, and mind, so there's the supreme path of directly crossing over, and individuals with middling or inferior faculties proceed gradually independence upon the grounds. These are the bodhisattva bhumis, or grounds, stages of realization, and paths, five sequential paths to perfect awakening. So to determine which, whether you are a person of middling faculties, to investigate this, first of all, merge your mind with empty external space and remain in meditative equipoise for 20 days. By so doing, the first type of individual will perceive the originally pure essential nature of the primordial ground with the eye of wisdom, and they will identify this within themselves. The, the first is between middling or inferior. If you're middling, then that's what you'll realize. And then you skip the sequential path of shamatha, vipassana, and so forth. You just rest in awareness, and you can go directly to the culminating phase of Dzogchen, the direct crossing over, you'll be a little bit like this kid you may have seen in the news, a little nine-year-old Belgian kid, you see him? And when, when he was five years old, presumably kindergarten, his, his teachers recognized that he was pretty bright. 
And by the age of nine, he'd finished his undergraduate education in mechanical engineering. And he didn't even bother to get a degree because it's such a waste of time. He just directly went for graduate school. He's, he's looking for a really good PhD program now at the age of nine. So he's going direct crossing over. <laughs> he skipped almost all of ele elementary school, all of high school, went directly to, uh, to undergraduate in mechanical engineering. I guess he probably did that in six months. And now he's going for a PhD program. Okay? So that's a person who brings in great momentum for Apparently, just his parents who were both doctors. I think said he just he just like a sponge. It just he just sucks in knowledge, just absorbs everything that he learns, and um, so that's a prod prodigy for what he wanted to do with his brilliance, his mechanical engineering. Good. I think he's going to be hopefully of great service. But there are people like that for Dharma, and they're generally identified as tukus. So if you if you're a person like that, then you are a tuku. But someone who's called a tuku isn't necessarily like that. So be careful. Titles can be misleading. Oh, not so. So I think in terms of external space, you can read from uh, Sera Kondo, who was a great, great yogini within the Jujum Lingba lineage. She was the consort of, of Jujum Lingba's eldest son. She was an accomplished yogini. Her consort, her partner, was an accomplished Dertun treasure revealer. She was as well. Quite spectacular. So I've translated two texts of hers, and she's fabulous. Great, great icon, great paradigm. And so, for other, other women, Ed, and but anybody, anybody who's drawn to Dharma, she was spe spectacular. So let's leave off with that, that set of notes just for a little while, and now let's go to page 20. So now on this last morning of the retreat, it's time to finally, what, what did they say, let the shoe fall, or something like that, drop. Let's get, get, get to it. This has been a shamatha retreat. So then, we've used this word so many times, and you know that it comes after you've evolved through all of the nine stages that we've now covered, conceptually. And then, there will come a day, and it's going to be a day, it's going to be an afternoon, and something, a very distinct point in your life where you have achieved gradually, gradually, gradually. You've achieved all the way up to the ninth stage. Your samadhi is superb, but your samadhi is still in the desire realm. You've not fully achieved shamatha, even though going for four hours or longer effortlessly. I mean, it was very good samadhi, but you still haven't achieved shamatha. And so, what's it like then? What's it like to actually achieve shamatha? Again, there's a lot of notes here, and I think you can read them. Uh, that you, you read them for yourself, and I think the translations are pretty good. So the Buddha himself describes this, and he describes es especially um, one's whole body and mind being filled with joy or bliss and well-being, with this joy and well-being born of a ta detachment, detached from all of the allures, all the attractions of the desire realm. Everything this world has to offer, sensual, fame, power, wealth, you name it, no detachment with this joy and well-being born of detachment, the joy and well-being emerging from, eudaimonically, emerging from your purified mind stream, emer emerging from that substrate consciousness, that mind that is not the mind, the mind, the manifest nature of which is clear light, from that, one so suffuses, drenches, fills, and irradiates one's body that there's no spot in one's entire body that is untouched by this joy and well-being born of detachment. Again, this, we see this in the next one, this, in this, um, this su Sanskrit Sutra, that this joy and well-being arising from solitude, the solitude not just being in a solitary place, but this solitude of removing all the tentacles of desire, of yearning, of hope, that something out there in the desire realm is going to prove satisfying. And knowing it never will. And then retrieving like an octopus or like tentacles. Re releasing them all. And saying, I know you'll never be satisfying, so I'm not going to place my hope in you any longer. And withdrawing it all into your awareness. And there, discovering this joy and well-being arising from solitude, which manifestly moistens, thoroughly moistens, totally satisfies, and totally permeates the body. There's nowhere in his entire body that is not permeated or pervaded by the joy and well-being arising from solitude, not even the slightest bit. And so, I want to really measure myself how, to, how much to linger here. We go with this, this Theravada classic, The Path of Purification. 
I think you can, read, you, can, you can read it for yourself, the distinction between access to the first jhana, which is achieving shamatha, as opposed to fully achieving the first jhana. And in both of them, you've crossed the threshold over into the form realm, a deeper dimension, underlying dimension of reality. And the only real distinction, pragmatically speaking, is that in both access to the first jhana, which is shamatha, the full achievement of jhana, that in, in both cases, you're equally free of the five obscurations, the hedonic fixation and all of those five, and ill will, and so forth. In both, you're equally free, but if you fully achieve the first jhana, then the five jhana factors, single point in concentration and so forth, they're robust, they're stronger than in access. But in access, you still have them. And so he, he oh yes. And then the bhavanga, here's a very nice reference to the bhavanga. The difference between the two kinds of concentration is this, the factors are not strong in access, simply crossing the threshold into the first jhana. It is because they're not strong that when access has arisen, the mind now makes the sign. This is the counterpart sign, that archetypal sign that emerges from the form realm. It makes that sign its object, it get, but then it can't sustain it. The, this archetypal sign, for example, of the air element, which is what you access by way of mindfulness of breathing, it's so subtle a hundred, a thousand times more subtle than any mental image that could occur for, in the desire realm, that it's elusive, and you engage with it, and then you, you can't quite sustain it, and you fall back. You fall back into the bhavanga. And so now makes the sign its object, now re-enters the bhavanga, just as when a young child is lifted up and stood on its feet, it repeatedly falls down on the ground, a little, a little baby, a toddler, falling back on his bum. So it's like that you fall back into the bhavanga. I read this and I really had drawn the conclusion that the bhavanga is the same as the substrate. The substrate, not substrate consciousness, but substrate. But the factors are strong in absorption, fully achieving the first jhana, and it is because they are strong when an absorption concentration has risen the mind, once having under, un, interrupted the flow of the bhavanga, rising from the bhavanga and engaging with this very subtle archetypal sign or form in the form realm carries on with a stream of wholesome, wholesome impulsion for a whole day and a whole night, whole night and whole day, just as a healthy man after rising from his seat could stand for a whole day. Now this is definitive, it's a gold standard, and it's almost universally ignored nowadays. And there it is in plain English. So many people nowadays, I think they're sincere and they're deluded. And that is, I, I hear a lot of accounts, and I, each time I get my hopes up, I'm talking about the Theravada tradition, both Asians and well as Westerners. And I've heard so many claims. I've achieved the first jhana, I've achieved the fourth jhana. And, and yet, if they claim to achieve the first jhana, can you do that? He just said, if you've achieved, fully achieved the first jhana, you can go into meditation, total absorption, completely oblivious of the surrounding world, and you can remain in unbroken, effortless flow of samadhi for 24 hours straight. That's just it. That's the gold standard. It's the gold standard in the Tibetan tradition, Hindu tradition, Theravada tradition. And so if people can do that, then I just want to bow. Fantastic, fantastic, whether you're Burmese or Thai or Australian or anything else. Fantastic. But that's something you can demonstrate. So I feel anybody who claims, I've achieved the first jhana, I'd want to say, first of all, I'm very happy for you if that's true. But if you're going to claim that, why don't you back it up? Anybody can claim, I've achieved the first jhana. A, a parrot can say that. Anybody can say that. And gullible people will believe anybody. But if you're claiming that, then good, then show it. Show it. Sit down for 24 hours without flinching a muscle. And if somebody takes symbols and crashes them right next to your ear, we'll know that you won't flinch. So I'm delighted for you if it's true. But if it's not true, if you can't do that, then you're passing counterfeit currency. And if you want to ruin the economy of a country, inundate it with counterfeit money. You'll ruin the economy because people won't know it's just paper and what actually is paper with something behind it. If you want to ruin the Dharma, if you want to ruin the Dharma, take away all credibility of the Dharma, just fill it with counterfeit claims about jhana, about realizing rikpa, about being a, an advanced Vajrayana practitioner, realizing dzogchen. So just fill it, inundate the market with false claims, usually, I think, not out of, mm, how do you say, dishonest motivations, just because people don't know what they're talking about. I think that's it. I don't think, by and large, the claims that are made 
are made by people consciously wishing to deceive other people. But really, how hard was this to find? It's right there in English. It's a free download, for heaven's sakes. <laughs> it's, you're not pirating. They want to offer it for free. And there it right is. If you've achieved the first jhana, you can go to samadhi for 24 hours straight. And yet the, way, the contortions that people will go through to say, oh, but he didn't really mean that, you know, kind of, oh, give me a break. So there it is. There it is. I won't elaborate. We move right on. And then in case there was any doubt, let's go to 21. The first bullet item on 21. But when he enters upon meditation after first purifying his mind of states that obstruct concentration, namely the five obscurations, and that happens with the achievement of the first jhana, then he remains in the attainment even for a whole day, like a bee that has gone into a completely purified hive, like a king who's gone into a perfectly clean park. So it's completely clear. We move into the Mahayana territory of what are the signs, what are the indicators you have actually fully achieved shamatha, and here just access to the first jhana in this classic sutra, once again, Buddha speaking to the Bodhisattva Maitreya in the Samdhin Nimochana Sutra, Lord, when a Bodhisattva directs his attention inwards with a mind focused upon the mind, as long as physical pliancy and mental pliancy are not achieved, what is that mental activity called? And the Buddha responds, Maitreya, this is not shamatha. It is said to be associated with an aspiration that is a facsimile of shamatha. He just referred to the ninth stage where that pliancy, that buoyancy, that lightness, and somebody just, just told me another good adjective, but I think you get the idea, of both body and mind, what takes place on that day that you achieve shamatha is a fundamental state shift. It's rather like going from 1.0 to 2.0, in an operating system of your body on an energetic level and your mind, the operating system has just gotten upgraded in a really cool way. Because now there's this pliancy, and this means the flow of energy, the prana, it's just free flow. We're not speaking of anything divine or transcendent here. It's just your body is now fit. Whether you're old or young, overweight or underweight, whatever you are, that's just flesh and bone. We're talking about the subtle body, and the prana is just flow unimpededly, streaming, streaming. And your whole body, as stated by the Buddha, the whole body is filled with a sense of bliss and well-being, and it's as supple. It's as supple as a gymnast performing in midair who can float. And your mind has the mind that arises independent upon this body and the subtle mind arising independent upon the subtle energies, the mind also, just a, a mind of grace, a mind of suppleness, lightness, buoyancy, malleability, able to perform whatever task you put to it. So it's physiological. A fundamental physiological shift takes place and you should be able to remain there at this new operating system for the rest of your life and, and, unless you suffer severe physical damage. And since that has shifted, the mind that's operating on the basis of that subtle energy system is also going to maintain those qualities for life. And if you've not achieved that, you've not achieved shamatha. And if you have, having first achieved the first nine stages, then you have achieved shamatha. So there's a long section here from a sangha, and, I'm just, and this is cited by Tsongkhapa, and I'm going to paraphrase it based on the oral transmissions that I've received as well from a number, number of teachers. They're homogenous, and this is gold. This is gold standard. So that day, let's say it's a Tuesday, and let's say it's 3 o'clock. 3 o'clock on a Tuesday. I just, I would just want to show the specificity of it in time. It's not, I think it happened last month or probably last weekend. No, it started at 3 o'clock on Tuesday. And I think an analogy isn't really bad, and that is a woman who spent nine months getting, you know, nine months being pregnant, and then the water breaks. Okay, the show has begun, right? I've seen it in the movies, I'm sure it happens. But the water breaks, this means, okay, you are now about to give birth. Hope well, it turns out well. The water breaks after developing through nine stages of shamatha, the water breaks when you're in meditation and you'll feel a pressure on the top of your head. And many, many yogis have experienced this, some of whom I'm, I know, and it's a pressure on your head as if you had a bald head and somebody is placing a warm hand on top of your, on top of your head. So it's a pressure that is not unpleasant, but it's just like that. And when you feel that, but bear in mind, you have to finish the first nine stages. So just don't feel, oh, I think I'm feeling some pressure there. 
<laughs> no, the first nine stages actually are a prerequisite. So if you haven't gone through the nine stages, you can't, you're not, you can't just think, I have a twinkle in my eye, maybe I'm going to give birth. It doesn't work that way. <laughs> just wanted, in case there was any doubt about that matter. You have to go through the whole nine stages. And so your water is broken. I'd love to see somebody have their water break and take them right off to an MRI with an EG and see what happens in the brain because they are now about to achieve shamatha. The water is broken. It's now they're, they're going to achieve shamatha unless they just die suddenly. But that's the first indicator. So, okay. You're, you're, you're now achieving shamatha. You're coming, you're coming down to the home. This finish line is right here. You're about to finish this journey. So there's that indicator. And then, shall we read it? Then, the unwieldiness of the mind, the rigidity, the heaviness of a mind that's not really operating like an engine that is not well-tuned, that disappears, and there's this suppleness, this pliancy of the mind that arises. You just feel the lightness, the buoyancy, the, the utter serviceability of your mind. That manifests. You experience your mind like operating system 2.0, like, wow, the mind is so light, so buoyant. I can do anything. I can visualize. I can analyze. You have the five jhana factors. Wow. And so that pliancy arises, mind. And then we're seeing one event trigger another. The mind has that pliancy, and there's no reason, no reason to point to my head, but there is, that's, I'm pointing there because that's where the first indicator was. Clearly something dramatic is taking place in the brain, and I don't know that anybody knows because as far as I know, nobody's ever achieved shamatha in an MRI with EEG. I'd like to see that happen. Something's happening in the brain for sure. I mean, here, what's underneath your hand? A lot of brain. And so the mental pliancy, and that triggers then this radical shift, this state shift in your whole energetic system that now you experience this physical pliancy, this lightness, this buoyancy, suppleness, malleability of the body, just like that. And so, and it's, and it's a suppleness. It's stated, and this lingers afterwards, people who have achieved this feel, they say, I feel so light, I feel like I could jump over mountains. You can't, but you do have that sense of lightness. And so there's this physical pliancy, saturates the whole body, like just like supercharged the whole body. And then out of that, there arises this just body-permeating sense of well-being and bliss. Your body's just blissed out. It's saturated. As Eddie said, there's no part of your body that's not touched by bliss, and the bliss is the symptom of this pliancy of the body. Just as unhappiness, being ill at ease, grumpy, and so forth, are a symptom of a mind that is heavily encumbered by mental afflictions. You don't need any help. You don't need any stimulation. That's genuine unhappiness. That's a symptom of a mind that's afflicted. And this is a symptom of a mind that is superbly tuned. A sense of bliss fills the body. And then I think of this symbolically. The bliss completely fills your body. It's kind of like when you have a, a pot of milk on the stove, and then it just overflows. It boils over. This bliss that fills your mind then boils over and fills your mind. And your mind is just filled with bliss. Ecstasy is the word. We have a good word for that one. Your mind is just saturated by bliss, ecstasy, rooted in a sense of well-being. So the body's bubbling away, the mind now is bubbling away, bubbling, overflowing, saturated by bliss. During which you really can't do much of anything else. You're just, you're blissed out. But don't worry, it won't last. Because <laughs> you would be useless for the rest of your life. You just, uh, don't worry, it's not going to last. But it doesn't just vanish. It's really like that pot of milk that's boiling over, and you just turn it down to a simmer. And that bliss comes whoo, like that, saturates your mind, and you just rest there. And then the ecstasy, the, the ex extraordinary bliss, then subsides. And it simmers. And now there's just a quiet flow of all five jhana factors. Single-pointed, course investigation, subtle analysis, well-being, and bliss. But not teeth-chattering bliss. And now everything is simmered down. When that's simmering down, now you've achieved shamatha. That's when you've achieved shamatha. 
And if you just keep, take good care of your body and mind, you'll keep it for the rest of your life. Whether you be able to carry it through the bardo, well, that depends on what you do with it. But you achieve this now, because now you have the fer perfectly tuned body and mind to do the most meaningful thing a human being can possibly do. Free yourself. Free yourself from ignorance. Free yourself from delusion. On a bodhisattva path, achieve bodhicitta. Achieve vipassana. And set out on the path. You have now have a mind that really is service, for serviceable for the path. So, just reading through, here's a quote from a Sangha, brilliant, Tsongkhapa, brilliant. These are definitive presentations of that day on which you'll achieve shamatha. And you'll remember it. You'll remember that day better than your birthday because it's a fundamental discontinuity, a shift, a radical shift in the whole way you're present in the world. And then you can explore on that basis, what's it like now that you have achieved shamatha? What's it like simply to dwell in shamatha, to remain in shamatha? What's that like? And then very importantly, ever so importantly, when you get off the cushion, get off the cushion, and you're round about getting, you know, having a meal, walking around, engaging in people, what are the trait effects? What are the lingering benefits that carry, carry through the whole the rest of the daytime and percolate over into the nighttime? How does this influence your sleep? How does it influence your dreams? And you can just find there are no downsides to this at all. It's all good. You're just, your whole quality of being in the world now is fundamentally shifted. And so the state effects, the trade effects, these, we, these can, we can look at after the break. But briefly, there's a lot of material here, but again, I wanted to give a lot so you'd have background material. You can read at your leisure. But I will guarantee to you that every, and every Buddhist scholar knows what I'm, what I'm about to say is true, anybody who knows, the sources I've cited for, Buddha, for Theravada Buddhism, it doesn't get any better than the Buddha, and it, in, ter in terms of commentator, there's nothing go more gold than the Buddha Gosa. That's it. I just hit the gold standard. That's not an opinion. That's true. And we come over to the Mayana tradition, the Sandha Nyamochana Sutra is just definitive for Shamatha. It's the absolute gold standard. Among the great patriarchs of Indian Buddhism, there's no one, none better for Shamatha than Sangha. He's just solid gold. We quote him twice. Within the Tibetan tradition, no one more brilliant than Tsongkhapa. That's gold standard. And so that's what I wanted to offer you. There's a lot of counterfeit money out there. There's a lot of copper and silver and metal and dirt. But this is gold, solid gold. So if you want to know what Shamatha really, before it gets watered down, before people bring it down to their level, and this happens a lot. People well-meaning, but desperately wanting to feel they've achieved something, desperately wanting to feel they've achieved something, then look around at their own experience, and then they drag jhana down to their level. They drag stream entry down to their level. They drag realizing pristine awareness down to their level, and so forth. And they take their own experience as the supreme authority, and then anything it differs from that, they say, but that's not, not to be taken literally. No, no, not that. Not Buddha goes, no, not. he didn't mean that literally. When he said that when you achieve the fourth jhana, your, your, your breathing stops entirely. No, I didn't really mean that. He didn't, no, no, because I want to believe I've achieved the fourth jhana. So don't take that literally. Count on me. It happens too often. I'm so tired of it. I'd rather not achieve the gold standard, but no, I haven't achieved it. Rather than achieve something less and thinking I've achieved gold. Because the latter is delusion. And the first gives you room for growth. You know what you haven't achieved yet, so good, keep going. So I say this quite passionately because there's so, a lot of counterfeit money out there floating around, floating around, propagated by the Buddhist media sometimes, too, too, too commonly, and people with big names, too commonly. One big name, I thought he'd check with his friends, Dharma friends, after 40 years of practice to see if any of them had actually achieved complete freedom from mental afflictions. Found that none of them had. So then he redefined our hardship, saying, well, our hardship is not really being free of mental afflictions. It's just getting to the point where you're not bothered by them anymore. And then he started handing out honorary our hardship. That's kind of cheap. Drag it down to your, if you can't get to its level, well, just drag it down to your level. Maybe nobody will notice, except I do. Not because there's anything special about me. Believe me, there isn't. But these are gold standards, and the lamas under whom I've trained, both in the Theravada tradition and all schools of Tibetan Buddhism, they're gold. I don't think I need to defend the Dalai Lama or the junior tutor of the Dalai Lama. 
and the other great masters I've had the tremendous privilege of training under. So let's just go for the gold and not mistake anything. Any, don't think that anything that glitters is gold. And what glitters is what's popular in the media. It may be gold. Maybe it just glitters. So let's take a break. It's now 10.30. So time is running out. See you at 10, 10 minutes before the hour.